But right now, let's jump into 1 John chapter 5. Title of the message is, Our Confidence in Christ. Our confidence in Christ. Our sure foundation that we stand on in Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful that when we place our confidence in Christ, we are on stable ground. When we put our confidence in anything else, we are on shaky ground. Isn't it amazing how much we just trust things by just by nature? We just, you know, we trust a lot of things. How many of you saw the news this week? A pregnant gal goes through the drive through at McDonald's, orders a latte. And you know what she got? She trusted, she had confidence that she was getting a cup of coffee. But this pregnant woman got a cup of chemicals. Instead of coffee coming out of the machine, they left the cleaning chemicals cooked up to the machine and they poured her a cup of chemicals full strength. Fortunately, she wasn't injured. The baby wasn't injured. She spit it out. It tasted that bad. But isn't it crazy? Like, you go to the doctor and they give you a pill and like, how do you know what's in there? You go through In-N-Out Burger and you're like, how do I know they didn't spit in my burger? Sorry. <laughs> How do I know this in and out's pretty clean? I mean, in and out's amazing. Bad. I, I should have said Jack in the Box, right? I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, but no, there's so many things that we put our confidence in. And as a result, a lot of times our hearts get broken, don't they? We get our confidence in the wrong things. But here's the thing, if we put our confidence in Jesus Christ, we have a rock that cannot be shaken. We have a foundation that cannot be moved. We have a house that will withstand any storm. And that is the purpose of 1 John. Again, the series, how can you be sure? Well, here's how, by building your life on Jesus Christ. Where's your confidence this morning? Is your confidence in, in, in Jesus Christ? Do you know why we look to God's word? Why we spend so much time on it on Sunday? Not only on Sunday, but through the week. Why we open it up? You know why? Here's why. Because our confidence is in Christ. And in times of joy, in times of fullness, and in times of darkness, we look to God's word for instruction. Why? Because our confidence is in Christ. Powerful. Powerful. We forgive others when they wrong us, when they step on us, when they spitefully use us. We forgive others. Why? Because our confidence is in Christ. We believe his word that says, hey, hey, it's better to forgive. They did the same thing to me. Better to forgive. And show grace so that you don't become a bitter person. And we look at God's word and we go, yeah, that, I'm going to walk in your ways. You see, our flesh says, no, 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 I'm going to put up walls. I'm going to protect myself. And that feels good for a moment. But the same walls that we put up are the same walls that trap us in. And our life gets smaller and smaller. And so we stand confidently. Our confidence is in Christ and we do what he says. We forgive others when they wrong us because our confidence is not in us. It's in him. We seek fellowship. We seek prayer. We don't face our troubles like the rest of the world does. We don't go drown our sorrows in alcohol. No, we enjoy each other's fellowship when we call brothers and sisters to help us out and we enjoy the body of Christ. Why? Because our confidence is in Christ. You see, saying our confidence is in Christ means a lot more than just a nice platitude. Oh yeah, yeah, our confidence is in Christ. No, it changes the way we live our life. It's more than a theological statement. It is the way we live. We serve and we give instead of take. Why? Because our confidence is in Christ. My flesh tells me, hey, get all you can. 
Live for number one. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, baby. You better take care of you. And that makes sense to my flesh. But you know what I found out? My life is shallow when I walk that way. And I found there is, Jesus was right, there's more joy in giving than in taking. And when I am a giver, I find that my life increases so much more that I cannot outgive God. And the more I serve, the more he serves and pours into me. The more I give, the more he gives and pours into me. He's, you just can't beat him. He's more generous than I am. And so this is what it means to put our confidence in Christ. It is more than a theological platitude. It is something that we walk in in life. And over and over in the book of 1 John, what we're learning is we can know that we're in Christ because we're experiencing these things in our life. We can know that our salvation is in Christ because we're living these things out in our life. We can know that we have the love of God in us because on my own, I wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm doing in Jesus Christ. And we can be sure because our confidence is in Christ. And so with that rambling introduction, let's jump in. Uh, chapter 5, verse 11. Give me one more amen if your finger's on verse 11. Amen. I love it. Your Bible is so important that we read it. And I just love that you guys all bring the word, pen and paper out. What an amazing church you are. I am so blessed to be your pastor. Verse 11, let's read in the word. And this is the testimony. This is where we left off last week. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Yeah, last week we saw the witness of God. And this is the testimony of God. That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. This abundant life. This rewarding life. This fulfilling life. It's in Jesus Christ. This eternal life, it's in Jesus Christ. He who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you. What things? What things is he talking about? He's talking about the entirety of 1 John. All the studies that we've been over, over the last several weeks, uh, the last few months, these things I have written to you, he says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. There is a powerful word for us. He is saying, hey, listen, I am telling you these things so that you can know, so that you can be sure, so that you can be steadfast. This is God's message to us, he says. This is the message, the divine witness that has been given over and over and over again. What is it? Here it is. It's simple. Are you ready for it? Here it is. He who has Jesus has eternal life. This is God's message from the beginning. He who has Jesus has eternal life. Great message. Such a clear message. Such a simple to understand message. Such a simple message to receive. He who has Jesus has eternal life. Here's the question. Do you have Jesus? Oh, I hope so. Is your confidence in Christ? Or do you put your confidence in your own abilities? Isn't it interesting the tension that is there between putting our confidence in Christ or our confidence in other things? When we sin, do you know what we're doing? We're saying, what this offers is better than what you offer, Lord. It's saying, I have more confidence that this will satisfy me then what you will offer will satisfy me. Now we may not think all that. It may not be a conscious understanding of all that. But down at the core when you boil it down. That's exactly what's happening. When we sin we're deceived. And we're thinking that this is going to satisfy. More than what God is offering. 
And his message to us from the beginning is very simple. This is his message. Hey, he who has Christ has life. Both now and forevermore. Such a clear message. So easy to understand. So easy to receive. But it requires faith to walk in in life, doesn't it? I'm amazed at the simplicity and the complexity of the message. It is so simple that even a child could understand it. It is so simple that even a thief on the cross can understand it. Even a man who's a murderer and an insurrectionist and a man who has just gone his own way his whole life can understand and say, wow, Lord, I believe who you are and I believe what you're doing. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I believe you're the Messiah. So simple. Tall, today you'll be with me in paradise. Your sin's forgiven. Righteousness bestowed upon you. A, a murderer, a thief, an insurrectionist, forgiven like that. What a gracious God. So simple that a child can receive it. So simple that a thief on the cross can receive it. So simple that a sinner can receive it. Two men go into the temple to pray. One beats his chest and says, Oh Lord, have mercy on me. I'm so messed up. And Jesus says, Oh, I tell you the truth. That man walks away justified. Justified? Made just as if he had never sinned. Made righteous. Such a simple message. And it's his message from the beginning of time. From the beginning of time. Others are like the religious guy who went into the same temple to pray. And he said, Lord, I thank you that I'm such a good person. That I try so hard. That I do the right things. That I'm always working to... And his trust, his confidence. Where was his confidence, church? In himself. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. The sinner went away justified. And that man did not. Such a simple message. And yet, so profound. A message that affects every decision we make in life. And even though I've walked with him for now 25 years, even though I'm a pastor, I'm amazed how sometimes I still am prone to put my confidence in my own abilities, in the things I can hold on to. I find it fascinating, don't you church, that this has been God's message, not from the New Testament only, but from the beginning of time. What has been God's message from the beginning of time? Well here, that he who has Jesus has life. You see, all the way back in the garden with Adam and Eve, do you remember? Adam and Eve sinned, they fell, they got separated from God, and what is the first thing God does? God comes looking for them. What a good father. They were hiding from God. God comes after them. I want you to know you're here this morning not because you chose God but because God chose you. No, I don't think so. I chose to come to church today. No, you responded to the Spirit's prompting on your life. He's drawing you to himself. We are so selfish. We would never choose God on our own. We would always choose self. But something worked in you. The Holy Spirit called you and said, Hey, 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 come to me. I have some things for you. I want to bless your life. I've got a better foundation for you to build upon. And Adam and Eve, they thought something. They put their confidence in something else. And God said, no, 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 no. Come back to me. I want your confidence to be in me. And what did God do for them? They had tried to cover their own sin by the works of their own hands. They sewed together fig leaves to cover their spiritual nakedness. And what did God do? He said, sorry, that's an inadequate covering. I will clothe you with a sacrifice. And he sacrificed an animal. It was the first time they had ever seen death. He took the death that Adam and Eve deserved and he transferred that death onto an animal. And then he clothed them with the skins of that animal. Do you know what that's a picture of, church? That's a picture of Jesus. Our punishment being transferred upon to him our death being transferred upon to him and we are clothed with his perfect righteousness. 
And so from the beginning of time, this has been God's reoccurring message. He who has Jesus has life. Do you remember Israel when God brought them out of Egypt? They've been in slavery for how long, Bible scholars? 400 years of slavery in Egypt. You know what that is? You know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of being enslaved in the world. Egypt is a picture of the world. And your slavery is a picture of sin. That's what sin does. And God said, hey, in a moment, in a day, in an instant, I'm going to deliver you. It's going to be on Passover. And here's how you can be delivered. Whoever believes... Put the blood of the lamb above the door of your house. And what will happen if you do that, church? The angel of death will pass over your house and have no power over you. Oh, the picture of the cross. Just put the blood over your house and death will have no power over you. And the next morning, you know what happened? They left what? No longer slaves. They left free, free, new lives in Christ. Do you know what happened the day after? Oh, by the way, who's that a picture of, church? Jesus. Do you know what day that Jesus was crucified on? The same day, Passover. All that was a foreshadow of Jesus. On the exact same day, Jesus died on the cross to put the real blood over the doorpost of your heart so that the angel of death will pass over you. We're going to take communion together today, a very picture of that very thing. Do you know what happened the day after Passover? Or the day of Passover, I should say. You know what happened? Not only were they free, something else happened. They, God instructed them to do something in their house. What were they to do in their house? Get rid of all leaven. Leaven free house. Get rid of it. You got bread with leaven in it? Throw it out. You got tortillas? Get rid of them. Anything with leaven, get rid of it. Why? What was the symbolism? Sin. Leaven is a picture of sin in the Bible. And all your sin completely removed. Seven, the number of completion. All your sin removed. Seven days. A, a, a picture. A picture of what? This message that God has for us from the beginning of time. He who has Jesus has life. Right? His message from the beginning. The bronze serpent as they're going through the wilderness. Do you remember the bronze serpent? Sin, snakes, snakes coming out of the wilderness and they're biting God's people. Thousands of people dying. Wandering through the wilderness. Snakes, bam. Ah! God save us. They had been talking trash about God. They had been despising God's provision. A blistering line they gave God. We're so sick of this manna. Our soul loathes this worthless manna. Really? That's your sustenance in the desert. You might want to rethink that. And so God allows snakes to come in. It's amazing that he prevented them all those years. But for a moment, for a brief season. Really? You want life without me? Okay. And he allows snakes to come in and bite them. What's a snake a picture of? Sin. Sin, yeah, right in the book of Genesis, the first picture, sin, snake is a sin, you know. And here's what happened. The snakes began to bite them and they dropped dead. And God tells Moses something very interesting. He says, Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent and I want you to hold it up. How many of you have ever been to the hospital? How many of you have ever seen an ambulance? Guess what's on every hospital, guess what's on the ambulance? A serpent on a pole. That's where it came from. Get a bronze serpent, make it out of bronze, put it on a pole, and hold it up. And God did something really weird. He didn't say, I'm going to take away the snakes. He didn't say, if you look at the bronze serpent, you won't get bit by the snake. That seems like that'd be easier. That's not what God did. You know what he did? He said, make a bronze serpent and hold it up high as the standard of Israel. And everyone who looks at it, when they look at it, if they get bit by a snake, guess what will happen? Nothing. But if they take their eyes off the bronze serpent, they will die. And what's the picture? Bronze, the picture, the metal of judgment in the Old Testament. The snake, picture of sin. The pole, a picture of the cross. 
Sin judged on a pole. And if you keep your eyes on that, guess what happened? Sin might still bite you every now and then. He didn't take away the bite. Sin might still bite you. But if your eyes are on Jesus Christ, guess what happens? Sin will have no power over you. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, just as the Moses raised up the serpent on the pole, so the Son of Man must be put on the cross, that all to look to him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son for that purpose. And so this is God's message from the beginning. I could go on and on and on and expound over and over and over again. Reoccurring stories all through the Old Testament. And they all point to this same message. Here's the message. Get it clear. Say it with me. What's the message? He who has Jesus has... Say it with me. He who has Jesus he has life. Put your confidence in him. Because that's where life is found. It's a great message. And over and over and over again, it's been God's message from the beginning. There's a second part of that message. Did you catch it? The second part. What's the second part? He who has Jesus has life. And he who does not have Jesus does not have life. Wow, pastor. Why couldn't you just leave the first part of that message? Why don't you just make, say happy things? <laughs> tell us everything's fine. Don't tell me the second part of that. You know what? The world hates the second part of that message. Because that message says that if you don't have Christ, you don't have life. Or in other words, it says, hey, I'm sorry. All other roads do not lead to God. Do not be deceived. God is not like a giant ocean and we're all just drops and eventually we'll all drop into the same body of water and every religion is like a spoke on a wheel and it all comes to the same hub. Nonsense, lies, deceit. The message from the beginning of time is listen, if you have the Son, you have life and if you do not have the Son, you do not have life. There is no other provision for your sin. There is no other name under heaven in which we must be saved. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, that is great news. It is great news. A message so simple, a child can receive it. A thief can receive it. A sinner like me can receive it. A message so profound, it grows me every single day. And it challenges me when I see things that dazzle and I think, wow, it looks like life. No, 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 that's death. Don't go there. All right, Lord, my confidence is in you. Where's your confidence? Where are you putting your confidence? Here's what I want you to know. If you put your confidence in Christ, you will stand firm. You will stand sure. It'll be revealed in your marriage. Where are you putting your confidence in your marriage? Well, I think we just, we want to, we want to explore. We want to, really? Because life is in Christ. Where are you going? What are you doing? Where are you searching? This is his message from the beginning. He who has life, excuse me, he who has Jesus has life. He who does not, doesn't. What are you believing? Look at verse 13 one more time for me. I want you to circle a couple of words. Verse 13, these things I have written that you, to you who believe, circle believe, believe in the name of the Son of God. The name of the Son of God is Jesus. God has a name. His name is Jesus. That you may know, I want you to circle the word know, that you may know that you have eternal life. The word know in the Greek is gnosko. It's the same word used in the Septuagint in the book of Genesis when it says Adam knew his wife and she conceived. What kind of no is that? That's a pretty intimate knowledge. That's a pretty intimate knowledge. That you might know, gnosko, that you have eternal life. Some people hope they have eternal life. Some people wish they have eternal life. Some through life go through life, well I hope when I get there, God's going to, you know, God doesn't want you to hope. And if you're hoping something's wrong, you're doing this your way, you're not doing it his way. Because the Bible makes it very clear, God wants you to, say it with me, 
know that you have eternal life. That you might believe, that you might know, third word I want you to circle, that you may continue, continue. I want you to circle that. In other words, that your faith would be maturing, that it would be growing, that it would be continuing, that it would be progressive, that your faith would be more mature next month than it is this month. That the things that you struggled on when you were a toddler, you're not struggling on when you're 18, spiritually. I remember when I got saved, my wife was pregnant. Both Lisa and I were not believers. Neither of us raised in Christian homes. We were married. We were pagans. We were doing all things wrong. Uh, You know, we didn't know God. And I got saved. And my wife was pregnant. And I remember when my son Jordan was born, I had this really cool parallel to look at because I had a brand new physical life and a brand new spiritual life, me. Physical life, my son. Spiritual life, me. And I go, wow, he's eating solid food. Am I eating solid food? He's starting to walk. Am I starting to walk? He's starting to run. Am I starting to run? He's starting to bite. Oh, I guess every analogy breaks down somewhere, right? All right, that wasn't funny. Uh, But you get my analogy? Oh, he's becoming of age. Am I becoming of age? Oh, he's becoming a man. Am I becoming a man spiritually? Yeah, we should be growing. And that's what John says here. Listen, you might believe, that you might know, that you might continue. Here's, Here's something else I want you to write down. Not only is the message from the beginning so simple and clear, he who has Jesus has life. He who doesn't have Jesus doesn't have life. Here's the other thing that we want to know. Our salvation is eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is eternally secure. That's what he's telling us. Listen, you believe, I want you to know you've got eternal life. When do you have eternal life? Here's what I want you to know. In Christ... Because you're in Christ, we don't have to wait, we don't have to work, and we don't have to worry. We don't have to wait, work, or worry. Say that with me. Wait, work, worry. You don't have to wait, you don't have to work, you don't have to worry. What does that mean? Eternal life, you don't have to wait. I hope one day I have eternal life. Can I tell you something? I've got eternal life right now. I already have The the God of eternity living inside of me, leading, guiding, directing me, I know I am never going to die. Life has already started for me. Spiritual life. Spiritual life means you're in the presence of God. Spiritual life means you're walking with God. Spiritual life means you're not separated from God. Can I tell you something? Everyone on the planet is going to live forever. Living forever is not eternal life. Living in God's presence is eternal life. The 23rd Psalm, I love the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or in other words, the Lord is my shepherd, I've got everything I need. And he finishes the Psalm. You know the Psalm, you know, he leads me beside still waters. Uh, He makes a table in the presence of my enemies, you know. And he goes through and he gives the whole song. And he finishes the song, the psalm with this profound statement at the end. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, what? All the days of my life. And then when I die, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Eternal life already began. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What a great life. What a great foundation. What's going to follow me every single day of my life? Goodness and mercy. Well, what about when you die? I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What can stop a man who believes that? Nothing. Nothing. This is our heritage in Jesus Christ. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You know what that tells me? Our salvation is eternally secure in Jesus. I don't have to wait for it. It began now. I don't have to work for it. I'm not eternally secure because I'm doing such a good job pastoring this church. I feel safe. Yeah, you all chuckle because like maybe I'm not doing that good job. 
And I'm really glad that even if I'm not doing that good a job, guess what happens? I'm still what? Secure. I didn't lose my salvation because I acted like an idiot yesterday. Hopefully, to my knowledge, I didn't. But, but you know what I mean? I remember one time when the kids were young. Uh, um, this, my kids are all grown, but when my kids were long, you know, I went out in the garage, and it looked like Toys R Us just blew up, right? I mean, there were toys everywhere and stuff, and I had just cleaned out the garage, and for whatever reason, I got in my flesh, and I'm in there, and I grab a big wheel, and I go, man, I just cleaned this stuff up, and I grab a big wheel, and I toss it across the front yard. And right when I let go, I look like, and I'm like, two neighbors out there look at me like, is that Pastor Dave? <laughs> you know what's so cool? My salvation was every bit as secure at that sinful, carnal moment as it is right now in this divine moment. Because my salvation, our salvation, yours and mine, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, is not contingent upon what we do, but what he did. We don't have to wait for it. We don't have to work for it. That is an amazing, an amazing blessing. And how fortunate we are. How good is God. And you know what that does? That then brings us to the third one. We don't have to wait for it. We don't have to work for it. And we don't have to worry. Because we're not depending upon our own performance. Our salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. And what a rich blessing that is. God promised our salvation from the beginning of time. From the beginning of time. He said, listen Eve, I'm going to clothe you with my own righteousness. I'm going to take the punishment of your sin and I'm going to have a substitute the death for you. The substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ is the theological term. And he told Eve that from the beginning. That was God's message from the beginning. And when Jesus Christ, he pro God proclaimed it from the beginning of the time. And Jesus went to the cross and he paid the price of our salvation. Without work, without price. I love Isaiah 55. Oh, ho, he says. Ho, come all you who thirst. Come, all you who are hungry. Come and buy wine and food and a delightful fare. I mean, come to this amazing banquet and come and dine without price. Let your soul delight itself in the abundance of this rich banquet. That's what we have in Christ. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to worry about it. From the beginning, God promised our salvation on the cross. Jesus paid for our salvation. And on the cross, our salvation was finished. What did Jesus say on the cross? What did he say? It is finished. He didn't say, okay, it just began. You better start working now, baby. Because you owe me a lot now. No, he didn't say it just began. What did he say one more time? It's finished finished. Your salvation's done. I've paid the price. Now is the judgment of the world. The entire world is now judged. You're either in Christ or you're not. What an amazing gift. What an amazing gift. May we drink it in. May we bathe in it. May we build our lives upon that solid, solid foundation. First John is written that we might know that we, we might know we have eternal life. Don't be hoping you have eternal life. If you're hoping your eternal life, don't do that, man. Isn't it weird how we plan for everything in life? We plan a vacation. We plan for our kids' college. We plan our retirement. Isn't it amazing? We plan, we plan our weekend. We plan what we're going to do tonight. We plan for everything, but some people don't plan for eternal life. Don't hope for eternal life. Plan for eternal life. How do you do that? There's a solid ticket, man. Just he who has Jesus has life. Plan for it. Don't hope for it. Plan for it. And so this is his message. It's a powerful message. It is amazing. Uh, we have eternal security in Jesus Christ. Here's a question for you, church. Can a Christian lose his salvation? No, no. 
That's what John is saying. He's been saying, hey, it's not possible. Remember what he said last week? Look, look, a couple weeks ago, look at verse 4. Chapter 5, verse 4. Look what he says. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Overcomes, what tense is that in? Overcomes. Present tense. Whoever, over, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. You'll, you'll constantly be overcoming. It's in present tense. And look what it says. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What tense is that in? Past tense. What, what was in past tense? Our victory that has overcome the world. Our faith in Jesus Christ. He who over, who is he who overcomes the world? Present tense. He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. What's he saying? Your salvation is eternally secure. You're always overcoming and you have overcome. You're eternally secure. Can you lose your salvation? No. First John, the whole book is written so that you might know you're secure in Christ. And it's important that we, we look at that, that we know that. Look what Jesus said about our security in Jesus Christ. John 10, 27. John 10, 27 on your screens. Read this with me out loud, will you? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Let's stop there one second. Who's talking? Who's speaking? Jesus. This is the Alpha and the Omega. This is the creator of the universe. This is the God who became flesh. This is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And look what he says. They know my voice. They hear me. They follow me. And I give them eternal life freely. Now let's go on. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Yeah, anyone. Who does that mean? That means anyone. That means anything. The Gucci bag at Nordstrom won't snatch you out of his hand. The little seductress walking down the street calling your name won't snatch you out of his hand. The enemy who wants to deceive you and trick you and the alcohol, the gambling, the drugs, nothing can snatch you out of his hand. He is more than able to hold you secure. Look what he says. Neither shall anyone or anything snatch them out of my hand. The verse goes on. Read with me. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. What's the all? All things. Anything that might be trying to snatch them out of my hand. And so no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one and the same are one and the same. Nothing can snatch them out of my hand. Nothing can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one and the same. You ain't ever getting out of my hand. That's eternal security, church. And that is good news. That is good news. Here's another verse, Romans 8, on your screens. Uh, let's read this real fast. Someone's talking too slow up here, so we need to speed up. Um, read this with me. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why does he say, which is in Christ Jesus? Why does he say, which is just in Jesus? Here's why. Because it matters who you say Jesus is. If Jesus isn't your Messiah, then you are not eternally secure. But if Jesus is your Messiah, then all these things apply to you. And notice what they are. Not even death can separate you from the love of God. You are eternally secure. And I tell you what, we had a lovely church member go home to be with the Lord this week. She hadn't been here in a while, but her name was Bernice. I remember, you know, I remember vividly where she sat at Ada Harris. You guys all sit in the same place. I don't know if you know it or not. Yeah, you, you always sit right there. And you know where she would always sit? She'd always sit right here. There's a chair empty for her this morning. That's Bernice's chair right there. You know what I know? She took her last breath 
She had congestive heart failure. She was 89. Thank you, Jean. Jean was just a marvelous servant, loving on her till the end. She was 89 years old, and I guess she gasped pretty hard on her last breath. And she reached out with big eyes and grabbed her daughter's arm. And you know what I know? That lucky dog took her first breath in the presence of our king. I am so stinking jealous. I long for the day. Not even death itself can separate us from the love of God. And oh, I can't wait till I stand before him and I see him face to face. And this walk of faith is over. And he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord and you will be known even as you are known. Oh my gosh. Look at the assurance that he gives us. There's no angel. Principalities or powers. Do you know what those are? Those are spiritual demonic forces that it's referring to. No fallen angel. No demon. Not even Satan himself. Not things present. Not things past. Your past isn't going to keep you from the love of God. You're not too messed up to be kept from the love of God. You don't have too much history in your life. You've just been, your mom threw Cheerios at your face. And, you know, hey, whatever happened, your past cannot keep you from the love of God. Nothing can keep you from the love of God. Not height, nor depth, nor any created thing. And it is just an amazing promise. Do you know what that tells us? What does it tell us? We are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. And you say, Pastor Dave, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about my Aunt Pam? She was a Christian and she fell away. She's not walking with the Lord anymore. Now she's a drug dealer and such and such or she's whatever, right? You get the... What about her? Well, I would say, hang on. The story's not over yet. Watch Jesus do his work. Watch Jesus do his work. You see, there, there's, a, there's a beautiful thing about God. He's bigger than we are. And he's not only looking at the moment we're in right now, he's looking at the whole picture. And sometimes he lets the squirrely fish, he lets the one that is just a stubborn mule, he lets them kind of take the line and run away for a little bit. But he never lets them go. And watch him bring him back. I think all of us, if we saw King David at his darkest point, yet yeah, he's sleeping with Bathsheba. He's got his own wives. He's got all the money. He's abusing his power. He kills Uriah. Bathsheba's wife, his general in the army. He's lying about it and telling, making it look like he's the hero. Bathsheba's pregnant because of him. And he puts on the front like, oh, I'm going to take in poor Bathsheba who's pregnant. We don't want her to be a single mom. I, your godly king, will take him in. Can you, I mean, that's just repulsive. And there's God's man. You know what? All of us are pretty sinful and selfish. All of us. And if we looked at David at that point, we'd go, oh, guy's disgusting. Not in God's eyes. He's my son. And there's nothing that can separate him from the love of God. And God brings him back. And by God's spirit and by God's spirit only, God brings David to repentance, grants him repentance. And David restores his life, his walk. Give it time. Give it time for your Aunt Pam. Give it time. You say, hey, Pastor David, are you saying that every person in church is saved? Every person in church is saved? We're all eternally secure? Nope, not saying that at all. I'm saying every person in Jesus Christ is eternally secure. The Bible is really clear. There are a lot of people in church who aren't in Christ. Their confidence is in what? Their own righteousness. Over and over, the Bible teaches that, right? We've already covered some of that. But we're secure in Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you are secure, not if you're in church. Uh, for time's sake, I, I'm not going to take you to those verses. Uh, but I want you to know, you are eternally secure if you're in Christ. 
if you're in Christ. Um, let's move on in our text. Uh, verse 14. Are you tracking with me? Verse 14. Look what he says. This is the confidence that we have in him. This is where we get the title of our message. Our confidence is in Christ. This is the confidence that we have in him. The him is Jesus. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know, a lot of knowing here, we know that we have the petitions that we ask of him. Did you catch this? Did you hear what it said? Look at the confidence that we have in Christ. Look how sure we can be in Christ. Here's what it says. If we pray God's will, we can know Jesus hears us. Wouldn't that be good to know? Say, I know Jesus hears us. Say that. But you know what? That's not enough. It says a lot more than Jesus hears us. Not only does Jesus hear us, you know what else? It says Jesus answers us. Look what he says. This is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition... Wow, not only does he hear us, you know what else? He answers us. That's pretty amazing. Everybody say, Jesus answers us. But you know what? That's not enough. Not only does he hear us, not only does he answer us, he tells us more than that. He says, not only does he hear us, and he answers us because knows an answer, right? Knows an answer. That's not what he says he does. He says, not only does he hear us, not only does he answer us, but he says yes to us. Wow, that's incredible confidence. That if we pray anything in God's will, not only does he hear us, not only does he answer us, but he does what, church? He says yes to us. Do you have that confidence in your praying? Do you have that confidence in your prayer? And you say, hey, wait a minute, pastor. I've been with you this whole sermon till now. You know why? Because he doesn't answer my prayer. I hear you. I totally understand that. You know what I would say? You might want to pray differently. You might want to pray differently. Because what Jesus is trying to get us to understand, he said some amazing things to try to really get us to ponder what he was saying. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you say to this mountain, be removed, it'll go just be taken into the sea. Wow. Why did you say such big things? Because I'm trying to get your attention. You're not meant to have a prayer life where you just, oh, I hope, kind of like the lottery. I'm going to buy a lottery ticket today. I hope I win. Yeah, your chances are about, right? And we often look at prayer the whole way. Oh, Lord, please. And we're just like, I don't think it's going to work. But, you know, I'll try it. No, God isn't a lottery ticket. And prayer isn't a wishful fantasy. We can know. We can know. And if God doesn't hear your prayers, I would say, quit praying the same way. Quit praying the same way. You know what most of us do? Instead of quit praying the same way and praying differently, you know what most of us just do? We just quit praying. We just don't pray much. Because we really don't have confidence that it's going to do any good. And I understand that. I mean, sometimes I buy stocks and you know what? I, I, I tried a little bit and then I quit because every stock I buy goes... And if prayer is the same way, yeah, like, why would you keep praying? You probably wouldn't. You probably only pray when there's, like, big problems. And what I would encourage, instead of quit praying, pray differently. We must learn how to pray God's will. You know why? Because we're prone to pray what? Our will. Can I just make, a, like, a really obvious observation? Do you think God needs us telling him what to do? And when we pray and we're telling God what we think he should do or what we need, do you think God is going, oh man, thank you. I didn't know what to do in that situation. <laughs> but now I know what you want, David. Man, I am like, 
I'm on it, finally. I mean, I've been waiting for you to tell me what, you, what was needed there. Wow. That doesn't make sense, does it? That doesn't make sense. God says, hey, listen, Jesus said, I, your father knows what you need before you ask. Now, he wants you asking so that your joy might be full, but the purpose of prayer isn't to tell him what you need. The purpose of prayer is for you to line yourself up with God's will. I want to give you some examples of how we pray and what this means because I want us to have that confidence that he's talking about. That God hears us. No, better. That God answers us. No, better. That God says yes. I want us to have that confidence. How many of you would like to have that confidence when you pray? That God's going to say yes to this. Well, here's how you can. Learn how to pray God's will. Uh, that's part of our spiritual growth. That's part of our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know when my kids were little? How many of you as parents remember the first time your child said daddy or mommy? How many of you remember that? How many of you had your heart melted the first time your child said daddy or mommy? I remember. I remember. I came home from work. There was my boy. And I walked in the house and he goes, dad. And I'm like, woohoo! Kill the fatted calf, baby. Did you hear that? Yeah, I couldn't tell what that was. That was dad, man. That was dad. I know that was dad. Maybe nobody else knew it was dad, but you know what? I knew it was dad. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you think I'm totally insane? <laughs> yeah, the father rejoices when the child acknowledges, that's my dad. I'm happy to see him. Yeah, the father rejoices in that. Now, my son is now 29 years old, that son. If when I saw him, he went, Dad, I'd be heartbroken. You know what it would tell me? There is some serious retardation in this relationship. <laughs> Something hasn't progressed. And here's what I've learned about our Heavenly Father. We may call upon him from skid row and call him higher power. And you know what he does? He answers powerfully. Yes. That is the moment I am waiting for. I am your higher power. Here I am. Call on me, baby. I will show you higher power. But time goes on and he says, now I want to tell you my real name. It's Jesus. And I want you to know who I am. And if I am still calling him higher power... When I'm 25, there's some serious retardation in this relationship. And the prayers that God answered when I was an infant, he wants me to grow and mature in. He's trying to develop me. And he wants us to learn how to pray according to his will. It's part of our spiritual growth. We must learn how to pray our, uh, God's will because we're prone to pray our will. And praying our will doesn't work. Let me illustrate it for you. On the week that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, how do you think Peter was praying that week? What do you think Peter was praying that week? You say, Pastor, how could we possibly know that? Well, you can't. But you can surmise, you can get a pretty educated guess by the words that were coming out of Peter's mouth. I can be pretty sure, I'd be willing to bet dollars to donuts on it, that Peter was praying something like this. Lord, please help Jesus see how committed I am to him. So that he'll use me more than all the other guys. Because I think, you know, I'm the most usable out of all these other guys. And Lord, I really want to serve. And I, Lord, would you please work in Jesus' life so that he could see the gifts and the talents you've given me. Lord, I'm so excited about how you've transformed my life. And I really want to be used. Help Jesus to see how great I really am. Now that's a paraphrase, but I would be willing to bet I am like almost right on the mark of exactly what Peter was praying. And I know a lot of us as young Christians pray similarly. And how different Peter's life would have looked if instead he would have prayed God's will. Because you know what we know? He prayed that prayer and God did not hear him. God did not answer him. And God did not say yes to that prayer. Would you agree? Peter failed miserably that week. 
God did not answer any of those prayers. How different things would have looked if Peter would have prayed, Lord, my life has been so transformed by Jesus. I can feel you growing me. I'm so excited about it. But I've got this issue. I find myself wanting to impress everybody with this work you're doing inside me. I find myself wanting to serve myself and elevate myself in my, with my knowledge than instead of serving others. And I'm watching Jesus and he never does that. Help me to be like him. Big difference in prayer. And I wonder how different Peter's life would have looked that week if he wasn't so worried and he was praying, Lord, help me not be so concerned what others think of me and how I look in front of others. I wonder how different he would have behaved when that little girl said, aren't you one of his? He wouldn't have been so concerned about what she thought. He would have said, you better believe it, I am. But instead he said, hell no, I'm not one of his. The Bible says he swore to prove he wasn't. He started cursing. Don't write me an email because I said hell in church. I'm just trying to illustrate what the Bible's teaching us, okay? I don't go around swearing in life. And the problem is he was praying his will, will and his prayer life was boring. You know what happens? We do the same thing in our lives. We, we pray our will. And here's what I want you to know. I want you to write this down. Praying, praying God's will is a discipline with great rewards. Praying God's will is a discipline with great rewards. Most people pray what they want God to do. And as a result, God doesn't move. God wasn't waiting in heaven going, Oh, David, well now that I know what you wanted, now I can move from on high. No, that has never happened. And so we pray God's will and God doesn't move. But here's what I do know. Those who pray what God wants them to do, oh, God moves mountains. He's promised. But before we can know the will of God, excuse me, before we can pray the will of God, we have to know the will of God. And I want you to say this with me if you will. God's will, say that, will. is revealed in God's word. Say it with me again and hold your Bibles up. God's will is revealed in God's Word. Yeah, I want that to sink into us. Because that's going to require something. That's going to require if I'm going to pray God's will, I have to know God's will. If I'm going to know God's will, I have to read His Word. I have to read His Word, not with a daily exercise of going through a five-minute bread of life in the morning. Nothing wrong with that. But it's got to be a little deeper than that at times where I'm going like, Lord, man, I'm really struggling in my marriage. And Lord, what does your word say about that? I want to open it up. What do you say about being husbands? I want to find everything I can that you instruct husbands. I want to know what you want me to be. Before I can pray God's will, I have to know God's will. And that requires that I study the Bible, that I learn the Bible, that I learn what the Bible says about issues in my life. And when I learn it, I then meditate on it. I think on it. And I apply it. That's what prayer is. It's taking God's word, meditating on it, and applying it. I just realized what time it was. Oh my gosh, I could sit here and talk all day. Please forgive me. The communion table is set, and I just realized what time it is. And oh my gosh, um, I'm going to end abruptly. I said we were going to finish the book of 1 John. You got another week with me. What can I say? Um, we'll pick it up right here where we left off so abruptly. Sorry for the crash landing of the airplane. Uh, put your seatbelts on. Put your tray tables up. Um, and we'll pick up next week on knowing and praying God's will.